Kelly Goldsmith is a brilliant researcher in the space of marketing and human behavior. She was the person who helped America understand why we were hoarding toilet paper at the start of the pandemic. Yeah, it was her, her work that helped us understand scarcity and it helped people laugh at themselves in the midst of a really stressful situation, lockdown. I wanted her on Amstigator because I wanted to understand what her research could teach us about ourselves. Why are we so afraid to just step out and live with purpose? She explained it's all in how we're wired. So this is Kelly Goldsmith. Okay, so Kelly Goldsmith. That's me. You are an amazing researcher, and I love all the things that you're doing as it deals with human behavior and scarcity and how we can really understand who we are and why we do the things we do. You know, the things that we kind of just do and don't even realize we're doing it. But you have kind of taken this whole thing in your life to say, yeah, okay, a lot of us are doing this particular thing. Why? Yeah. So I just really want to dig into your research today and specifically understand how we can take some of that and say, okay, all right, for any of us who want to live a life with purpose, for right. any of us who want to like choose something for ourselves that may feel against the grain, yeah. what are we going against in our own, you know, sort of like psyche and our own yeah. makeup to still have to overcome that and make it happen? So I, I'm looking to you for all oh, of the sure. information. Sure, I'm going to solve all the problems. First of all, thank you for being uh, interested <laughs> in my research. As an academic researcher, oftentimes like you, you do all these experiments and you publish in these elite academic journals and no one reads them besides your mom. So it's very flattering to me that, that you read some of this and you and you care, it's very kind. Um, so yeah, I, I got into the field in 2004 when I went and got my PhD at Yale in behavioral decision theory, which is essentially, it's a lot like behavioral economics, but it's more geared towards taking an understanding of psychology and using it to better explain everyday choices and decisions that we make. So a lot of my early research was on goals specifically. So how can we stack the deck in our own favor with respect to pursuing our goals and staying motivated and what kind of gets us off track and how do we stay on track? That was a, of great interest to me. And then from there, once I got my first job, which was at the uh, Kellogg School of Management, I moved into studying scarcity and I how consumers respond to not having enough, which I think happens a lot, people. Yeah. And, um, and I actually think it's interesting because the, the longer I am in the field, the more I realize, I think scarcity and goals have a lot in common. Hmm. And I do think that one of the things that keeps us motivated is not having enough, right? Not having enough of something. I'm not right. strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the job I want. I don't have enough money in the bank. Right. Those are the kind of, that puts gasoline in the engine. So you call that scarcity. It is, it is scarcity. So scarcity is whenever you look at what, whatever you've got, right? Could be, we mainly study like quantifiable resources like money or time. Um, not kind of ephemeral things like love or companionship. Right, right, right. But you look at your bank account and you're like, okay, my goal was to have a million dollars in the bank by the time I was 40 and I'm looking at my bank account and I've got $850,000 just sitting there in a savings account. <laughs> well, Wouldn't that be great? Can we trade? No, just send me checks, people. No, I would love that. It's at Kelly Schreiner uh, on Venmo. Uh, no, <laughs> anyways, so. You look at your bank account, let's just say hypothetically, you've got 850,000, your goal was to have a million, it's that deficit that really motivates you to do something about it. Because if you look at your bank account and your goal was to have a million and you've got 1.1 million, why would you do anything, right? Mm, so okay. I always try to convince people that feeling of scarcity, that feeling you don't have enough, it's really just a goal with kind of bad branding, right? Oh. So you're gonna have to dust off the bad feelings of like, oh, I'm not where I wanna be and actually use that uh, to get you fired up and to get you motivated to kind of close the gap. Okay. So let's kick it back to goals. Mm -hmm. Let's get, let's start there. So, I mean, because people really understand goals. Yeah. So if I say I want to lose 10 pounds and this is just like, I'm throwing it out, right? Yeah. I, I want to lose 10 pounds six months from now. Yeah. What is right or wrong with the goal that I just set? And what do I need to be thinking about to make it happen? There's a, there's a lot of factors. So I'll cover just a few of the big hitters. One thing is it's good to set a specific quantifiable goal. So saying you want to lose 10 pounds is better than just saying, I want to lose weight. Okay. Or I want to do my best to be healthy. Like it sounds nice to say, <laughs> I want to do my best to be healthy, but that actually doesn't move the needle in part because you can't measure it, right? Okay. So a specific quantifiable goal, I want to lose 10 pounds in six months. You're already starting off in a pretty good place. 
But then what you really need to make sure you do is instead of responding to that goal as a threat, because goals can be threatening. Yeah, they, they can. Of course <laughs> they can. Like you get on the scale and you, you want to see it 10 pounds lower and some days it's going to go up despite all your best intentions. So rather than seeing it as a threat, which can lead to maladaptive responses like compensatory consumption, so maybe you feel bad about yourself. <laughs> I love but, how you like say this in scientific terms. Well, uh, but you know what I mean, right? I do, so I like do. It, you look at the scale and you wanted it to go down, but it went up and you don't know what happened because you were on the Peloton. Why me? So rather than respond by like doubling down on the goal, it can be tempting to say like, I need to feel better. And when we need to feel better, the things we do for mood repair mm. are sometimes, uh, they have deleterious consequences. Sometimes that's a fancy academic term to say they undermine yeah. our goals, right? So if I want to feel better and therefore I drive to high five cookies and eat three cookies. Are you speaking from experience? I'm speaking from personal experience just yesterday. Um, you know, that's going to undermine my fitness goal. It tastes delicious. It makes me feel better in the moment. But again, it's, it kind of hacks away at my long-term interests. Right. So I think that's the real problem is it's not like you already set a great goal. So the goal setting piece you've got not everybody has that. You need to think specific quantifiable goals that you can measure and track. Mm -hmm. The second part is not getting down, like staying the course. Because one thing that's yeah. true, uh, and I'm talking like on and on. Uh, I love it, by the way. You're like, very kind. You, are, like, you are the one who talks in this. I talk very little. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be hard to edit because I just won't stop. Um, so one thing that's true about all people is that when we set goals, we tend to have unrealistic timelines because, and it's just human nature. When we set a goal, we're not thinking about all the life stuff that's going to get in the way. We're not thinking, oh, there's going to be a carnival at my kid's school and I'm going to be pressured to eat a snow cone. We're not thinking there's going to be a holiday party. Like you just don't think about all the life stuff. Yeah, yeah. And because you don't think about the life stuff, you tell yourself, oh, this is going to get done in the next six months when in actuality, it just might take longer. And when we don't see the progress we want, either because, you know, weight is kind of influenced by a lot of stuff and maybe it doesn't always go down, even though we think it should, or when we don't see the progress we want in the timeline that we expect, it can be really demotivating. And a lot of times that can lead us to give up. And therefore, that's bad, right? Yeah, Giving up right. is bad for goal pursuit. So I think really the name of the game with goals is sticking with it and uh, sticking with it, like having strategies for staying positive and remembering the goal and uh, not interpreting it as threatening over the kind of longer time course. Gosh, I feel like that becomes then this like internal conversation that you have to have with yourself yeah. and almost like an awareness yeah. with this kind of thing of knowing, um, okay, okay, I, I see what I'm feeling right now, being able to recognize it and being able to turn it around, identify it, yeah. and then be able to say, wait a minute, have the self-talk yeah. that almost like it's you, hard. you are the coach yeah. of your own life and yeah. saying, wait a minute, this is we know this is happening, right. but we're going to stay the course here. You know, um, I, How do you apply that to, like, as you're saying, more ephemeral things, things that can't be measured? Yeah. And, and do we try to just make something quantifiable if it's not otherwise quantifiable? So this is a really good question. And I think because like you take a problem like loneliness, which is a big issue in the United States. It's a big issue before the pandemic. It's a bigger issue mm -hmm. after the pandemic. We have seen a massive increase in what they call these diseases of despair that are related to feeling lonely and socially isolated. And you know, you could die from these things. So like, how do you tackle an issue like feeling lonely when you can't really set a specific quantifiable goal? So I'm sure there's different schools of thought on this and I'm just going to give you mine, which is that it really is helpful to try to make it quantifiable, which is to say like, like, and I honestly, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but I've done this. So when I moved to Nashville, I didn't know anybody, right? And so I'd make a spreadsheet that was like literally the names of all the people I had met, right? I still have this spreadsheet. It's a Google Doc and it's Nashville underscore social. And then I would track, like I'd write the dates that I hung out with them and like, oh, like actually, do I need to circle back? Or if I'm feeling lonely, go look at the sheet. Who have you not talked to in six months? Send them a text. And it sounds goofy and it is goofy, but honestly, it's hard to feel lonely when you've got a list of 20 people that you haven't texted in six months, right? That, that's kind of on you. So I think with those more ephemeral, th ephemeral things, one thing you can do is try to break them down and make them more quantifiable. Another thing that's really helpful, and we did this, I did some research on happiness, and what we found is a lot of people want to be happy. Of course, everybody wants to be happy, right? Yeah, it's normal. Yeah. But people don't actually take steps to pursue happiness, in part for a variety of reasons. One is like we just think happiness is supposed to happen and we don't think we're supposed to work for it. So that's one reason why people don't actually try to convert happiness. Um, another thing is people don't sit through and think about like, okay, well, what can I do to make sure I'm happy, right? Like what people are the daily- People don't do that? They don't, they don't. They don't do these like daily, we, we developed this process called the daily questions where we, and we did this study with like tens of thousands of um, Fortune 500 employees by now. 
and they were asked to reflect every day on did you do your best to be happy mm. and we had this in contrast with the classic um employee engagement survey which would ask you right. like are you happy at work right and what we found is if you ask people are you happy people tend to say no no, no right <laughs> because like if you ask people are you happy what that's really interesting to me is from the psychological perspective like what comes to mind because if i ask you you know are you happy or if you ask me are you happy automatically i start thinking well like did i get any papers accepted? Did I get any like validating emails? Did yeah. any students laugh at my jokes? So it's almost like we look <laughs> to the outside world for validation when we're thinking about if we're happy, which is weird because also like we are people in the universe that have some control over this. So if you ask people instead, did you do your best to be happy? Mm. People don't think about like, oh, did I get that nice email or did I get that compliment from a student? What people think instead is, well, what did I yeah, do? It's right? an effort question. It's an effort question. And it's like you look at your own behavior. So when we ask people, did I do my best to be happy? Almost nobody says like 10 out of 10. People really reflect and they say, you know, I knew I should have called my mom. It would have made me feel great to hear her voice and I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And we found those daily questions that ask people to introspect on if they did their best are very helpful for these more amorphous goals because it shifts your focus to the behaviors you can engage in to actually make progress towards them. Okay, so this is really interesting because like what I'm, what I'm getting from what you're saying is when you ask someone just simply, are you happy, it almost allows allows them to let others be in exactly. charge of that. Exactly, exactly. But if it's, what did you do? Like, right. what did you do to right. try to be happy? What was your best to try to be happy? That does put the onus on self yeah. for self to you know, execute and try to go after happiness. Yeah, and that's I think that's important. It's weird for these more amorphous goals that we don't automatically recognize ourselves and like as agents in constructing our own happiness when we are, right? Like yeah. we are the decision makers for the most part in terms of if you can't even, because I've dealt with people at companies where they say, well, I can't change what I do during the day. My day is very prescriptive and I have yeah. to do all these tasks for work, so of course I'm unhappy. And then my pushback is like, well, you can change how you think about it. Or you can change what you're thinking about while you work on those tasks, right? Like God knows there was a stage in my career when I had to suffer through infinity, really long, boring faculty meetings about things like the color of the chairs in the PhD student offices, like things that were not super important uh, in life. But what I would do is I would use that time, use that quality time to make myself a beautiful to-do list of things I was gonna do after the faculty meeting. And it's not, I mean, I wasn't the most involved employee in those faculty meetings, but seriously, <laughs> do you need 32 professors voting on the chair color for the PhD student room? No. You do not. So I changed what I was thinking about during the meeting and I uh, allowed myself to enjoy the time more. Is that, I mean, I'm wondering if that's quantifiable. I, I do agree with you that changing your attitude is everything, um, but I'm wondering what does the research say about changing our attitudes mm -hmm. as it deals with any situation that we don't totally love or maybe don't think we have control over? I think it's, it can be tough to measure changing your attitude, but it's much easier to measure changing your behavior. And I think changing your behavior changes your attitude. Oh, okay, you know what I mean? yeah. So like if you say, did you do your best to be happy? And you think, oh, during that faculty meeting, I was just ruminating on how much I hated being there and I was getting myself worked up in this negative state. Next faculty meeting, I'm going to make a list of all the people that I need to get, like old friends I need to get in touch with or something mm -hmm. else during that time that's gonna make me feel a little more fulfilled then I will end up happier if I actually follow through on those behaviors. I, I love what you're saying because I do feel like there's a, I know I felt like this for a while of like, okay, I'm gonna fake it till I make it. Yeah. Am I happy right now? No, yeah. but I've gotta, I'm gonna have to be what I really want. Yeah. Right? Like I'm gonna have to act the way that I really want things to be, yeah. act as if things are that way. Yeah. And it almost feels like when you continually put yourself, the act of putting yourself in that place, then you can then begin to believe uh, what you're actually acting through. Yeah, I think there's something to that. So there's like the Amy Cuddy research and she has a book called Presence and she has like one of the top TED talks of all time. Um, and she talks about this fake it till you make it idea. And if you stand in the power pose, you feel more powerful. And there, she does have, some of the data is a little shaky, but a lot of the data is good showing that it does just, it's called um, embodied cognition. So like if I, if I sit in a more expansive posture when I'm talking to you, I feel like I'm more in control of this interview, that kind of thing. I think there's something to that. So that's this fake it, and that her whole thesis was she always felt insecure. So she was gonna fake it till she made it. And she had a dance background. So she used her body mm. to sit in more powerful ways and by doing so, she felt more powerful. She ended up being a professor at Harvard, has one of the most successful TED Talks of all time, <laughs> best-selling book. So I guess she made it, right? So good <laughs> a hand, you know, high five to Amy Cuddy. But um, the one downside I would say to this fake it till you make it perspective is for some people I have seen it where 
you feel like there's an off-screen, on-screen version of yourself. Okay. And that actually can get pretty depleting. Like, if you feel like when you're at work, you're on stage, and then when you come home, you're a different person, like, over time, that can feel like, yeah, I know. See, <laughs> look at you. I'm looking right at you. It can feel, it, it kind of erodes your, it um, does. I don't know what to say, because it's hard to manage. It's hard it to is. manage. It's hard enough to manage oneself. So right. it's really hard to manage two selves. Right. And I mean, I've been the person too, where it's, I've got my work clothes and I've got my home clothes and I've got my weekend clothes. I mean, it's yeah. just like, yeah. well, and on top of that, you and I are the same in that we came, I, I guess we achieved things under our maiden name, kept our maiden yes. name professionally, totally. get married, but you also took on your married name. Yes. And so I, I actually, in addition to feeling like I'm two different people sometimes, yeah. I actually live with two different names. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Very so like, stressful. I think for, for women who, who have done that, mm -hmm. you know, have their professional identity, have their mom identity, that does become, because you start using your married name as it deals with your right. children. Right. You and know? then you're like, who am I today? I'm confused. What are you calling me? Like, I know. It's, it's, I know. It's batty. So there's a lot of that, There's right? a lot. And that's depleting. It's depleting. And it's really interesting to me because, I mean, I've been a professor in a business school for infinity years, it feels like, but I think in actuality, like 15 years. And um, the students to me today say different things than they did 15 years ago. Tell me more. Yeah. So today they say things like, well, one of these students was talking about if he should take a job at a, a kind of a big famous company. And he, and he said, you know, I'm just worried I can't bring my whole self to work. And I was like, wow. oh my God, I can't even bring 10% of myself to work. What are you talking about? What is this for my whole self to work idea, wow. right? And I think what's, what, what the younger generation, um, and you're very young, but younger than me, but the younger folks. I'm not like college co-ed young, well, Kelly. Well, fair enough. Um, but <laughs> it seems like younger people have this idea that like they want to be consistent. They want to be authentic and they want to be the same person in all areas of life, yeah. which I, I was never raised with that expectation. And I thought having this like super polished work self and a totally different home life was two different names, you know, yeah. operating under two different identities. I thought that was fine. And so it's interesting for me to see that younger people now um, are moving away from that. Yeah. And I think with respect to managing, like knowing who you are and feeling confident about who you are, there's a lot of benefits to just having oneself. Um, but also, you know, secretly there's some cost because there is research showing that if you have, I mean, we're going to call it multiple identities. So that sounds a little bit like a psychiatric disorder, but we won't treat it as we a won't, disorder. It's, it's not, not a disorder. disorder. Um, but there is some research showing that like, if you have, for example, with undergraduates, if they have a strong social self and they have a strong academic self, having these multiple different selves, if one of those selves takes a hit. So like if you get dumped and you're heartbroken, but you have a strong academic self in undergrad, you respond a lot better and mm. faster because you've got this other person that you can right. still be. It's not like your whole world is shattered. Right. Uh, and the same is true the opposite way. You, you have a strong academic self and a strong social self. If you get terrible grades, you know, at least you can, you've got friends, yeah. you know? And so there are benefits to like, to literally feeling like you have separate yeah. identities because if one takes a hit, you got somewhere else to go. Gosh, that's so interesting too, because I feel like, I mean, I'm in my late thirties. And so now at this point, it's like, I have lots of friends who are having um, almost like parallel paths where they're yeah. having amazing professional careers. Yeah. And then at the same freaking time, it's like some majorly detrimental situation in their marriage. Yeah. You know, so they're like on these parallel paths, best year of their life professionally, yeah. worst year of their life personally. And, and I, you know, I'm hearing that research and I'm thinking, wow, what does that do for us as adults when we're going? God, my marriage is failing right. or gosh, I'm about to lose my job, but Hey, at least my kids are healthy. You know, yeah. like wh where do we, where do we take that from this college right. study to then adult life? I mean, I definitely think there's something to that. Like I've, I have seen, I have, I mean, I've had a million girlfriends with a million boy problems over the years. And I've definitely <laughs> seen, um, women who like repeatedly like date the wrong guy. And it's just like, you, you've read this book before. I've girl. read this book. <laughs> I could write this book myself. Like, I mean, we've seen, we've all seen this, right? So you got the friend who repeatedly dates the wrong guy, at least in what I've observed. Oftentimes it's those women who are kicking butt in their careers. And it's in part because, well, if this self is not panning out, like I want to do well at something, right? These are all smart, capable, talented people. So if you're not going to lean in this direction, you're going to lead in that direction. And it is like, I mentioned this compensatory behavior. It is a little bit compensatory because if I, you don't have perfect control over your love life, right? So if you can't, get where you want to be in your love life. Well, like my professional career may be more under my control. I've got milestones. Yeah. I've got goals. I've got a boss. Yeah. I know what the boss wants to see. 
And so you can achieve over here. Right. That's really interesting. Let's talk about scarcity. I, yeah. I know a lot of your work came, I mean, it's been prominent for a while, but I think when, co when COVID started, mm -hmm. you know, that became a thing. Like you were, you were interviewed all the time it about was. scarcity because I mean, God knows everyone was buying toilet paper. It was crazy. I never and, thought. And everything yeah. else. Right. And so let, let's just talk about scarcity as it deals with your research sure. and then we'll just delve more into it. Yeah, so I started studying, um, it's so funny looking back on it, because I started studying scarcity really in like 2009, 2010, which I considered coming out of the Great Recession, right? right? And so I, I thought it was important to understand what happened when kind of everyday folks, whether or not their objective resource levels took a hit, so whether or not you actually lost your job or lost money, we yeah. were still just constantly bombarded with these reminders that the world was running out of stuff. There weren't enough jobs, there wasn't enough money, there was, you know, uh, climate change issues. And so how do these daily scarcity reminders affect our behavior? Mm -hmm. And so that was what I got interested in studying. And what we generally observed in our early work was that these reminders of resource scarcity, what we call resource scarcity, we call it a resource because it's like specific and yeah. quantifiable. So these reminders of resource scarcity generally led to more selfish behavior. So if we brought our participants into the lab and had half of them think about not having enough of a specific quantifiable resource, and the other half of, would they be in a control condition, think about something else. And then we had them, you know, divide up money between themselves and other participants. And it was an anonymous thing where nobody was going to know if they kept it all for themselves. The people who thought about scarcity did keep more for themselves. Or if we had them do it in a different experiment, we gave everybody an extra dollar for showing up. And we asked them if they wanted to donate the dollar to UNICEF. And we found that people who kind of had scarcity on their mind were more likely to keep the dollar for themselves <laughs> no, and less no, likely no, no, to no. donate to you. Know, the children of Sudan. The Sudan's dollar stays friends, here. Wait, the dollar stayed there. So that that was how the research got started was basically this, again, these are like Northwestern undergraduates or online participants. And so what we found was with these populations, which, you know, I, I call them everyday people because they're not extreme in terms of their own resource levels. We found that these reminders of resource scarcity made them more self-focused and uh, pursued self-benefiting behavior is what we called it. Um, and so with that, we got the paper published and it was great. And that was in 2015. And then the pandemic hits and everybody's hoarding toilet paper. And I'm like the only, cause it's funny. Cause by the time my paper got published in 2015, we would enter it into the longest bull market of all time in the United States. So nobody cared about scarcity anymore. Right? So I had to like browbeat people to think this is remotely interesting. And, I, and I'm not even confident. I persuaded my parents. Right? So I got like, I got it published, but I'm not sure anybody read it. Then the pandemic happened and all of a sudden it was like, Oh, does anybody ever studied this? And yeah. I was like, it me like <laughs> pick, I did. Pick me, pick me. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I did a ton of press around it, and it, it was, I mean, nothing about the pandemic was cool. So I already am like eating my words, but um, it was interesting for me as a researcher to yeah. see that we did find these like everyday people when they had their everyday resources being threatened did protect yeah. themselves. Yeah. And I think what, for me at least, was was nice about having done the research is it, it was much harder for me to be judgmental about people during the pandemic, no matter what they did, because I think everybody was trying to cope and people yeah. have different coping strategies based on their beliefs or based on what makes them feel better. And for some people, just knowing they've got enough toilet paper at home made them feel a sense of security. It was like something they could control in these very bizarre times. Right? So, um, it was validating, I guess, to see, the behavior actually map onto what we'd seen in the lab. Well, and I'm thinking, where else do we see scarcity? Again, let's right. go to the things that are more amorphous, right? Yeah. And what are the things that we are doing that are holding us back with this idea of scarcity? Because like, I think of it as, um, you know, for my purposes in what we're doing here, you know, I'm trying to encourage people to live the life they're supposed to be living. Right. So what is that? I can't tell you what right. that is. Like that's something you have to do through right. this deep introspective dive. Yeah. But what keeps us from executing on that is it a scarcity issue where mm -hmm. we think hey i mean I, ca I can't go there because there might not be enough there might not be money there might not be security yes. what, what all is the that? things okay. okay first of all that deep introspective dive people are not into doing that for the most part right for a variety of reasons <laughs> one what if they find something hideous about themselves yeah spoiler alert you won't right but a lot of people have that worry you know if i like i you know when I had kids, you have kids, right? So when I had kids, they do all these scans and blah, blah, blah. And I swear to God, I was concerned. They'd like, what if they find my car keys? Like, I would, like, you know, I, 
you worry like what if they you know when they start doing all these scans like what if what if there's something in there that's not supposed to be there and it's it's the same with this well, wait, it's so funny to hear someone who like thrives on information be afraid of information and, but i am right and and i think it's especially true in domains where we don't feel like we have control so like pregnancy is a good example because oh yeah your body just does what it yeah, does your body is doing what it, which is terrifying for like a type a control freak like myself right that like it's just it's gonna be what it is it's gonna make the baby it makes it's gonna take the time that it takes and that that is the deal and you're gonna be okay with it and you're gonna just sit there and take it uh no it's it's terrifying so again i was uh, trying to control what i could control which i'm sure manifested in all kinds of insane behavior um apologies to my husband but um but yeah i was really worried about like more information was scary and information can be scary especially yeah. when it's like those dark recesses of your brain mm. where you don't know what you're gonna find and like what if you discover you married the wrong person or what if you discover that you pursued the wrong career that's threatening yeah, right yeah so number one there's the problem that people are scared of what they're gonna find number two there's the issue that this deep introspective dive does take resources in terms of time yeah. time and effort and, well, and, and, and energy. money and it can take it money. can take money it can take I mean all the things right and so it's really easy to push off those types of activities when you've got like things right in front of you that need your time or your money or your energy. Like, and I think there's good research um, by Meng Zhu and Chris Shi and other people that do the same kind of research that I do that shows that um, we prioritize urgency over importance. They call 1000%. It, right. So like, they call it the mere urgency effect. Like even, even stuff that is, is really trivial. If we feel like, oh gosh, well we got to get, it's good. This thing has to get done today. Like you're going to prioritize that. Yeah. And everybody's life, like, I, I hate to break it to you. I'm sure you know this, but like your life will always have fires to put out. It just is what it is. So in order to allow yourself to do that kind of deep dive, you have to make peace with the fact that you're going to have to slow down your response time on the fires, which is threatening. Yeah. And devote some cognitive energy and effort to this self kind of self-focused pursuit. So that's another reason why I think it's hard to kickstart yeah. the introspective journey. And then also, so that's kind of the big pieces, but there's also the how piece. Yeah. Like I have seen people, dear friends, family members who wanted to like find their true purpose and they don't know where to begin with the the this actual steps you can take. Yeah. Now, I will say in this day and age where we have increased access to information, you could get every book on audiobook and stream it while you're multitasking. Like there's ways to get access to great minds who will break it down for you about how you can do that type of introspection. There's workbooks, there's all kinds of stuff. But you got to go out there and and I think people worry sometimes especially when they're getting started. Like I had a good friend, really good friend, super smart girl, super successful career-wise who kind of wanted to go on this journey. But she was like, well, if I pick the wrong workbook, then like, I'm going to get the wrong, I get the wrong answer. I'll get the wrong result. Yeah. And like, well, I ruin everything. Like I'll leave my husband and quit my job and end up, you know, goat farming in um, Brazil. And, <laughs> and it, I, I, if I do it wrong, I would say um, we need to demystify that. I don't think that's accurate. And also I don't think whatever you uncover, it's not a dictate. That's another thing, right? right? right. Like you take, take it if it works for you. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Yeah. Let it fall away. Let right. Fall absolutely. Away. Um, I, I think it's interesting too, how like the way the pandemic has affected so many of us, like mm -hmm. it has forced introspection because it took everything away. There was right. zero urgency. I right. mean, think about like the, t the only other time in our lives where we've had nothing on our calendar. Right. I have a distinct memory of like this magnet calendar we keep on the fridge. And I was like erasing it and I was going, wow, yeah. there's literally nothing on here. So I think for the first time in many, for many of us, we had to, the only thing we could do was yeah. reevaluate life. Um, but I feel like some of that trauma causes growth. Oh, 100%. And, and yeah. what, I mean, are you seeing a difference almost in people now as opposed to before? I think that the short answer is yes. I think it's complicated, but this notion of post-traumatic growth is real and I don't think it gets enough airtime. And um, I think we see one, one kind of more obvious way that we see this manifest is this notion of the great resignation that a lot of people quit their jobs and the job market, the labor market has shifted completely. You, know, you go to high end restaurants and they seat half the tables because they don't have enough wait staff because people quit those jobs. There's a huge issue with nursing. There's a huge issue with teachers. There's a huge issue with police officers. Like a lot of people have, have quit their jobs. And I mean, I think the most straightforward explanation is when you take a step back and do some introspection, they realized it wasn't for them. Yeah. So, and I think even though the great resignation has been problematic with respect to, you know, workforce management, I also think it's good for people to take that step back and have that pause and evaluate if they like what they're doing or if they want to make a change. So I think that's the most obvious example we've seen post pandemic. 
of people kind of operating a little bit differently. Yeah, where they're asking themselves the questions. I think that's so interesting. What else do you think isn't getting enough? You're saying like the yeah. post-traumatic growth isn't getting enough airtime. What else are you thinking needs to be part of the conversation that's not? Well, I think post-traumatic growth, as it relates, so I've, I've studied it in the context of scarcity. Like a lot of good things can come from not having enough, which is why I think that scarcity is just a goal with bad branding. Like I think that feeling that we don't have enough because there's not enough toilet paper on the shelves or because we had a financial goal and we are below it or because whatever our, our thing that we want to achieve is. Like that feeling of not having enough can feel so bad that, and, and there's a million fires to put out, so we're focused on the fires and there's, we have this like lingering sense of um, a lack of achievement yeah. that can stay with us for a really long time. Yeah. And so I think it's really great. Um, anything that you could do um, or I can do to help people actually kind of stare that in the face and realize it doesn't have to be so scary and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. All it is is a call to action. All it is mm. is some recess of your brain telling you that there's something you want to do or something you want to achieve and you're not there yet. So yeah. do it. So do it. Don't yeah. be afraid. Don't Look be afraid. You know, and the fires are the fires. You could one thing, I mean, people don't do enough is enlist social support. So like if you friends or spouses or coworkers or family members, whatever it may be, you know, if your life that's in front of you is truly out of your control, I, try to get some help. And if you can't get some help, take this thing in the back of your mind, stare it in the face and break it down into specific concrete actions that you can take that will make you feel like you're making progress. Put them in a spreadsheet or make a to-do <laughs> list or put it in a journal, whatever, like get it out of your head yeah, and get yeah. it on paper. Those kind of things will make you feel better. And I, I mean, I actually think that like achieving your goals sometimes doesn't feel as good as like being empowered to acknowledge them yeah, yeah. and actually write down the steps and then evaluating if that goal really even means something to you. What, I, what I'd love for people to be able to start to get rid of is that lingering yes. sense of not having well, it's enough. It's like an albatross. Too, it is. Right? Like it's, it's, not, sort of it's not doing you any favors, just sitting there making you feel bad about yourself. So <laughs> I think we can turn it into something good or we can stare it in the face and realize we don't care about it and yeah. say goodbye. Yeah. But just don't let it just sit there and torture you. Yeah, I'm glad you say that. And something too that I'm thinking as I'm listening to you is like this realization, maybe this has come with age, like this realization that I'm not the only one who feels that way. No, everybody feels that All way. of us yes. have some thing that's yes. lingering that's sitting on our shoulder can I tell you one of the things that I've been yes. working on but I haven't even been working on it and and you just saying that makes me think I just need to do this I am chronically three four and five minutes late yeah. and it really bothers me yeah. like it's only five minutes why can't I just leave my house five minutes earlier and instead of actually turning around and looking at it in the yeah. face and being like I can actually address this I am powerful yeah. enough to you I can, mean can I can make one choice and I can do it yeah but but I'm just letting it linger. And literally every time I leave my house, I look at the clock and I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing? Why yeah. am I doing this to myself when yeah. I can make a simple choice? Obviously that's really simple and no, really easy to control. No, There's I like that. There's much bigger stuff. But I like that because but it's something you can change. It is. It absolutely is. And I think your thinking of that as a call to action is a great way to look at it instead of feeling the weight and, cr and crumbling under right. the weight of things that we feel like we either need to do or the weight of things we haven't done right. or need to do. Yep. Um, I, I almost wonder too if, if your research has allowed you to give more people more grace when you start yes. to say, wow, okay, we're all this way. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, for like how I, I mean, I was a reality TV show contestant, yes. right? So I <laughs> self-identified as being like manipulative and like kind of understanding people. And I'm a marketing PhD. I right? sell stuff, right? So like, <laughs> I'm an evil scientist. That was a big part of my identity. And unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, through studying scarcity, I have developed just like an insane, what I consider to be, an insane amount of empathy with people. And so now I do find it like, it's here's the upside. Though I had to like say goodbye to my reality TV show, evil scientist identity, the upside is like you, it's just, I, I don't get mad at people anymore because I do feel like everybody's just doing their best and everybody's living their values and everybody's trying to be a good person. And if somebody is a jerk in the parking lot, it's probably because they've got something on their shoulder that's <laughs> nagging at them and this trip to the grocery store was too much. You know, it's just, I, I can't be mad at people anymore. And I think in terms of my day-to-day -day affect, like I am unambiguously a happier person because I'm not <laughs> mad at anybody anymore. Like as I used to go through life, I'd be like, you know, judging people's motives and now I'm let that go. So. Again, it's sad that I had to, I can no longer be an evil scientist. Do you, do you think most people are good? I do. I think almost everybody's good. I, I, I mean, the, you can look at the base rates on like sociopathy in the population, it's tiny. So in general, most people are good. It's just that the behaviors they engage in to make it through their own day 
are different person yeah. to person. And sometimes they're hard to understand if what they need to make it through their day makes no sense to us. It, it, so it, when you just view it at a surface level, it can be difficult. But if you actually think it through, I mean, we're all just trying to be people in a very confusing universe where lots of stuff is out of our control. And it's hard. Yeah. And um, yeah, most people are good. Well, um, t just briefly, tell me how you got on Survivor and how you lasted so long. God, I didn't last that long. I um, I got on Survivor. This was back in the day. So it's it was like 20 years ago, it was right? Totally, it was totally 20 years ago. It was 21 years ago. Wow. So I was an undergrad and I was obsessed with season one because, again, I'd like, even from a young age, identified as this like evil scientist type. So <laughs> I, um, I was obsessed with the behavioral implications and I was obsessed specifically about like who got voted off and why and the social dynamics. I was really into it. So I, but I mean, that was season one, right? Now yeah. they have like 42 seasons or something. So it's like, I, I thought it was an expert because I watched one season, which is now hilarious. Um, so I watched season one like diligently. I, and, but it, again, back in the day, there was no, I didn't record the episodes and rewatch them, that kind of thing, which people do nowadays, right? Like I, people really are experts. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Like I was a, relative to like what people who are fans today do. I was a very casual fan. Uh, so I just watched the episode when it came on on television on CBS on Thursday nights. And that was it. So I, I watched season one, I watched season two, and I would have applied for season two, but I was too young. Cause you had to, at the time you had to be 21 to apply. So I applied for season three and I, I'm going to tell you the long version of the story. Apologies for the edit on this. But, um, so the in season two, I, cause I'd been sort of tracking some of the, uh, the ratings cause I was trying to be manipulative and schemy. And so in season two, uh, it, the first time the show, it was still the number one show in the country, but the first time the ratings took a dip was when Jerry Manthe was voted out and Jerry Manthe was like the bitch of the season. So I was like, okay, perfect. Like they're gonna oversample bitches in the next season because they know that's what's selling. So if I come out swinging, like I'm this like hideous bitch, boom, <laughs> I'm getting on the show. So, and I mean, that was good for me because I couldn't sell, like I can't sell Girl Next Door. I, I can't sell athlete at all. Like I'm wildly unathletic. I'm not a camper. Like I'm nothing going for me. So I'm like, bitch, I can do that, right? Like. <laughs> I can lean in. So um, I made this video in my cheerleading uniform with a t-shirt that said, I make boys cry. And I was <laughs> hideous, right? Like just like so bratty. And, and I was Duke undergrad. Like I was just like privileged and bratty and terrible. And I'm grateful that that's no longer on the internet. Well, and you did that on purpose, right? I did. That, but you sold it as like, this is who I really am. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I when I tell like people, I talk to a lot of people who want to go on the show now, and I always tell people there's like getting on the show and being on the show. Like getting on the show, you have to sell a character. Yeah. Being on the show, you can do whatever you want. So that was my route to get. I mean, I wasn't actually that hideous in real life. I was like a little hideous, but not that <laughs> marginally bad. Hideous. marginally hideous, like Duke University sorority girl level hideous. Um, but like no shade, girls, you're lovely now. Uh, but this is like cut it back to the '90s. Um, anyways, I was a little hideous, but not too bad. I portrayed though. I leaned heavy on hideous. So I, I made it past the first interview. Um, but like, so, like, oh my God, I was really trying. Like every question they asked me, I was like, what would a bitch say? Like I was trying so hard. You're like, this is acting. This it was is like, like acting it, 101. It was like acting. I mean, I wore like a dress I'd worn in my sorority formal and a diamond necklace to apply for somebody. It was ridiculous, right? But I made it past the first round. And then they flew me out to CBS for the second round of interviews. And you're there for like two weeks and you're doing all this psych testing, which is crazy. I don't know if they still do that now, but it was a long process back in the day when it was the number one show in the country. So um, I'm doing all this psych testing and the psychologist guy takes me aside. because I think he felt sorry for me because his kids, he was from San Diego and his kids went to school where I'd gone to school. So he was like trying to be nice. And he's like, okay, good news, bad news. Uh, good news, you're not a bitch. Uh, bad news, like you're not going to get on the show. So he said, look, like if you were bitchy, like you would be testing differently. You're like, you're not, you, you know, you're not, you're not selling this anymore. So like, I'm going to give you a tip of all the people that are left in the mix. You have the highest IQ. So why don't you just lean into being a nerd? And I was like, on it. So I, it just so happened. I had like built out this predictive model in Excel because you see the other people auditioning. So I built out this predictive model to try to predict like how long people were going to last in the game with all these cells in the spreadsheet. And for my next interview, when I was there, I was like, look guys, like this is why I'm going to win. And there's all this math behind wow. it. And they were totally like, oh no, she seemed to, she did a lot of homework. So we should just put her on the show. So they forgave <laughs> me for not being bitchy. And I got <laughs> on by being nerdy, which was good. Cause I could sell that too. Nerds aren't expected to be able to run very fast. So I, I leaned into that. <laughs>
I love everything about that. How many days did you last? I was on it 24 days out of 36, which is a scientific miracle. Like I'm asthmatic. (laughs) It's, it was, it was, I'm all, I hate camping. Like it was just a bad, I, again, I was really into the psychology piece because none of the rest of it was compelling to me at all. Um, but yeah, no, 24 days. And I mean, it was, it's, I will say like in terms of where you find resources of strength, like being on my favorite TV show as a kid, like as someone who was 21 years old, it was they could have made it much harder and I still would have been like, yay, you know, so I was very happy to be there and I, I loved everything about it. Like I loved seeing the, the cameras and seeing the behind the scenes. Like I, like if they had said, okay, you're not on the show, but you can be a PA and we're paying zero dollars. I would have been like, sure. Like it was just seeing the behind the scenes part was awesome. You're like, can I get a t-shirt? Like literally so happy, right? Like the nerdiest <laughs> fan to be there. So that part was really fun. Okay, I can't let you go without asking you the series of yes. questions I have to ask everybody when it. they're on the show. Okay, um, it's, well, it's a game. But okay. it's not really a game, but it is a game. Okay. All right? It's Maybe your kind of game. I'm excited. Um, this is not quantifiable. It is totally just whatever you want to answer. Okay. So when was the best time in your life? I, I have to say, the best time in my life is, so this depends on how you define best time in your life. Like, is it what's the most meaningful? Is it when I was the most happy? Um, I would say when I was the most happy happy, like pure, unadulterated joy, other, like other than having my kids. I love my kids, but there's also drama with kids, right? Uh, yeah. So that's hard to describe as pure, unadulterated joy. So um, I was really happy in high school, which I know is not everyone's answer, but no. like I freaking loved every minute. I loved the SAT test. I loved being on the yearbook. I loved doing the plays. I loved... I loved, I was class president. Like I loved everything. Stakes are low in high school. I really low. loved it. <laughs> I, I loved it. So, I mean that, and I feel blessed that I got to have such a positive high school experience. Cause I, you know, I know a lot of people don't, but I mean, I was, I was in Southern California. It was sunny. I was blonde. It was, it was great. <laughs> I feel like that makes you a less than one percenter. You know, like we usually think of it as a financial thing. I think to me, like <laughs> having you, a good high school experience, yeah, you're yeah. like a one percenter. I do feel really fortunate. Okay. Um, though there's cost to that too. Cause you assume the rest of your life is going to be that blessed. And then you realize like you're just a normal <laughs> everyday human. Um, so that was a bit of a come down, but uh, no, high school was, was a lot of joy. All right. When was the worst time? The worst time for me was probably um, tough call, but but because basically after high school it was all downhill from there. Um, but uh, I would say like grad school after college was in general like the age from like twenty two to maybe twenty, honestly to like thirty was hard. Um, you know, after I did Survivor, I moved to Los Angeles. One of my best friends passed away. That was really hard. Having a like my best friend die so young and all yeah. the stuff she missed out on. And, and then I went to grad school almost immediately after that. And grad school for me, cause again, like I thought I was the shit because like in high school I'd been good at everything. And then I get to get my PhD at Yale where I'm taking econ classes. This shows you my hubris. I took econ classes with PhD level econ students at Yale. I had never taken econ 101 as an undergrad. So I knew nothing, nothing. and they were geniuses. So like <laughs> I immediately get there and I go from feeling like, you know, secretly I felt like I hit a triple, but in actuality, I was kind of born on third base in some ways. So I get there and I'm like, oh my God, I definitely, I was born on third base. I definitely did not hit a triple. Like, this is terrible. I know nothing. Like it was, it was a massive crash. Um, and I was able, like, I was able, there was times when I thought I was going to get kicked out of grad school because I was doing bad at everything. Mm. And I'm, and that was not for lack of effort. And so that was just really hard on my self-esteem um, and hard on my self-concept because I'd always thought I was smart and talented and yeah. here I was being anything but. So that was really hard, uh, really negative, <laughs> but I did find a way. Yeah. Um, I did find a way, but it was hard. When uh, was a turning point for you? A point where you say, wow, everything in my life changed after this. Oh my goodness. There's been multiple turning points. I, I will say, I don't know if this is just top of mind because it's been more recent, but I was promoted to full professor um, a, about a, almost a year ago now. At Vanderbilt. At Vanderbilt. So, and as a professor, like, getting a job is a big deal and then getting tenure is a big deal and then getting to be a full professor is a a pretty big deal but um but then there's no more promotions Mm -hmm. right and so I got to promote it to full professor and I will say it was a turning point in the sense that prior to that everything was so like well how is this going to affect the letters people write for me when I come up for promotion or how like how are my teaching ratings going to affect what my colleagues think of me like it was all very um I want to say audience focused. Like it was all very thinking about how other people would react to my professional decisions rather than just 
doing whatever I wanted. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, you know, you don't become an academic for the money. Like a lot of people have become an academic to maximize their personal freedom. And I just never done that because I'd always been so focused on the next goal. And, and, and a lot of the way you get where you want to be is by having other people like your research or like your teaching or like you. So, um, you know, it was very, like we talked about with two yeah. different identities, like it was very, very thoughtful identity yeah. construction. So once I got promoted to full and I realized like I'm never going to have people write me letters again, ever, right? But you also don't need it anymore. I don't, because I mean, there's no more promotions, right? So I, I don't know. I think it's been a real turning point in just the way I think about my work, because now it's like, you know, whatever I take on, I have to take it on because I like it. Yeah. And, um, and that's good. Yeah. I think it's good. Do you have a moment of clarity in your life where you're like, oh, everything makes sense now? That has happened a few times. Um, I will say, I mean, I'm like, I'm like, which one should I talk about? Um, because as a researcher, like you find, you find, you like uncover some of these seminal findings in psychology and you're like, oh my God, understanding other people makes so much more sense. Yeah. Like, um, like when I started studying resources, I will say, and um, norms of reciprocity and how people give to get. Um, and hmm. why that's oftentimes like, it's just a part of how we socialize, right? And, yeah. and I, I started, it really changed the way I view a lot of social interactions because a lot of social interactions, even with friends, there's this implicit like, you came to my birthday party, so now I have to go to your birthday party. There's a lot of implicit norms of Does reciprocity. Does that make you angry? Because that kind of makes me angry in some ways. I'm like, I didn't, not, uh, I, you don't have to do that. That's not why I did that. I yeah. think there is give to get in a lot of situations, but like a lot of times, a lot of times, in a lot of situations, it makes me kind of like, stop, stop, stop. Just I don't give, know. Or let me just give. I'm yeah. not trying to like. Yeah, well, it's like when you, someone always wants to give you a present cause, and you're like, I did this to be nice. Stop. Don't give me that present. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I think for me, understanding that, and I think a lot of it, though, is you don't even know we're doing We don't even know we're doing it, right? Like, we don't even know we're giving back because someone gave to us like we just it just feels so natural and it's such a part of it's such a part of how we're socialized mm. um i don't know it's one of those things that made me less judgmental of a lot of social dynamics because i just think it's really baked into our culture and once you accept that it's like okay you know right. like i get asked to do um people do me favors and then i feel like immediately they ask they they ask me to do them a favor and it used to annoy me, but now I'm like, you know, this is the way the cookie crumbles. You don't yeah. take the favor if you can't give it back. And so that yeah. I think has actually been, it's been helpful for me. Yeah, that's so, that's so interesting yeah. too. Like, because you are such a data focused, numbers focused person, then to see like the fleshing out of yeah. the understanding of that data and how it's, how it's helped you almost understand the world differently or view people differently. Um, what is something about your nature you've either overcome or you continue to overcome? Oh my goodness, I am not, uh, the list is long. Um, I mean, one thing that I still struggle with is talking too fast. Um, I don't think that's a struggle. Though. I love fast talkers, just so you know. I appreciate it. So I'm only going to talk to you henceforth. No, I, um, <laughs> I, I'm really big on like inclusion. And I think it, it's one of those things where this push towards uh, diversity, equity, inclusion has obviously accelerated in the recent years. And I've always been a huge advocate for it, or at least I thought I was. And then you start seeing what you do and actually viewing it through a new lens and asking yourself, like, is what I do truly inclusive? And one thing is I've always gotten feedback from my international students that I'm hard to understand in class because I talk mm. so fast. And, and I was, it's really hard for me not to talk fast. Like, like for me to talk at a normal speed feels like I'm talking down to people. Mm. And so, um, I never changed that, even though I knew it was a problem for international students because I was like, oh, this is who I am guys. Right. And now, and I'm, now I'm trying to be more thoughtful about it because they're right. It's not inclusive if you're speaking in a way that alienates people in your class. I get that. So, um, so that's something that I'm working on. Um, just in general, being more inclusive and thinking about where other people are coming from. And, and also just recognizing, I mean, again, like when you're born on third base and think you hit a triple, like you have a, you have a skewed perception of how the world works. Like recognizing um, that everybody's coming from a different place and trying to be more aware of the privileges that I've had and more, uh, I, I guess, um, finding new ways to give back to help other people have more privileges yeah. too. What is your purpose? Oh my God, girl. Uh, my main purpose is to make it to breakfast. Um, I, hmm, what's my purpose? Honestly, I'm pretty purpose agnostic. Like I'm pretty okay not having a purpose right now. Um, it used to really bother me. Like I went through a phase where I'm like, on my tombstone, is it going to say here lies Kelly Goldsmith, marketing professor? Like, what does that even mean? So I, and you know, in my older years, 
Um, I've gotten okay with that. Like, maybe my purpose is to be a marketing professor. I think, you know, I try, I spend a lot of my time trying to help people have a little bit better life, and I'm, I'm fine with that. I love that. Yeah. Kelly, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> here lies Kelly Goldsmith, marketing professor. <laughs> So what'd you think? Tell me in the comments below, like it, share it with someone who needs to hear it. I'm adding new videos all the time to help you reconnect with self and then prepare for purpose. And since you're here, I've gone ahead and linked my playlist, the episode Amplified. It gives shorter clips from each episode, still though very much power packed with encouragement. It's all right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.